Welcome again. Before we can look at how oxygen is transported in the blood, it is most useful to understand the structure of the hemoglobin molecule. You would recall that hemoglobin is described as having a quaternary structure and that it contains heme groups. I would like you to try to put together your own model of the structure of hemoglobin. You come up with a model that looks something like this. With the four polypeptide chains joined together, each with a heme group containing iron in the middle. It is these heme groups that bind to oxygen. The binding of the first molecule of oxygen is fairly difficult, but once the first molecule is attached, the overall structure of the molecule rearranges or changes its conformation, making it relatively easier for the second molecule to be introduced. Then further changes occur that make it even easier for the third molecule to get attached. Finally, the fourth molecule of oxygen is attached with the greatest ease. Now that we've got the model of hemoglobin's quaternary structure, let's relate that structure to how hemoglobin binds to oxygen. Here on this axis, we can see percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. And here on this axis, we can see the partial pressure of oxygen given in the units of pressure kilopascals. This axis usually poses a source of confusion for students. The question is often asked, what is the purpose of measuring pressure on this axis when we speak of concentration of gases? Well, let's take this beaker, for instance, and use it to understand the meaning of the term partial pressure. Within this beaker right now, the pressure inside is equal to the pressure outside. So the foil covering here remains intact. For if the pressure outside were higher than the pressure inside, the foil would crush inwards. But because the pressure inside is equal to the pressure outside, then the foil stays in place. The composition of the atmosphere inside of the beaker is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, with a handful of other gases including carbon dioxide and the noble gases. If it were possible for me to take away all of the other gases from the inside of this container and just leave this with 21% oxygen, then the pressure exerted by those oxygen molecules would be just a fraction of the atmospheric pressure. In fact, it would just be 21% of atmospheric pressure. And it is this pressure that is referred to as the partial pressure of oxygen. When we refer to the partial pressure of oxygen, it's really just another way of referring to the concentration of oxygen. So we might as well just think of this axis as being concentration. Over on the y-axis, we have percentage saturation with oxygen. Now that we understand the conformational changes and the allosteric phenomena involved as oxygen binds to hemoglobin, let's relate that understanding to what's happening here with this curve referred to as the oxygen dissociation curve. Here on this axis, partial pressure increases. As partial pressure or concentration of oxygen increases, the percentage of saturation of oxygen in hemoglobin also begins to increase. Observe the different slope here, and then the rapid increase here, and then the decrease over at the top. Given what you know about the structure of hemoglobin and how it binds to oxygen, can you account for the fact that the curve takes on this shape as opposed to having a straight line relationship where oxygen concentration increases and there's a direct relationship with the percentage saturation. Recall that the first oxygen molecule that gets bound to hemoglobin, that's the most difficult one to attach. Once the first one's in, then the second and the third find it easier and the fourth slips in 
the fastest. So there's bound to be an initial slow phase as all the hemoglobins get loaded up with their first oxygens. But once that phase is finished, then oxygen begins to attach much faster, eventually reaching a stage where most of the hemoglobins have picked up their full amount of oxygen. So then we enter a state of equilibrium with almost 100% saturation. It is this 100% saturation that occurs in the lungs. Hemoglobin goes to the lungs, gets 100% saturated with oxygen, and then as it leaves the lungs and goes to the tissues, it releases some of that oxygen. In the tissues of a resting human being, hemoglobin would become 100% saturated in the lungs and then deposit some of that oxygen to the tissues. In cases where tissues are depleted of oxygen, like in cases of intense exercise, then hemoglobin is able to release even more oxygen. And just as the first attachment of oxygen was the most difficult, the first oxygen molecule to be released is relatively the most difficult and then it becomes progressively easier and easier for more and more oxygens to become detached from the complex structure of hemoglobin. It's important to be able to understand hemoglobin structure and the conformational changes involved as it loads up and unloads oxygen so that you can account for its S shape. In instances of intense muscular activity, body tissues produce greater amounts of carbon dioxide. When this carbon dioxide enters into the blood, it dissolves to form carbonic acid. And this has the effect of lowering the blood pH. When the pH gets lowered, the oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin shifts a little bit to the right. In the original oxygen dissociation curve, hemoglobin would have been releasing only a fraction of its oxygen. Now with the change in pH, with the shift of the curve, hemoglobin gives up even more oxygen. This is in response to a change in pH. This change in pH came about because of extra carbon dioxide going into the blood. And this extra carbon dioxide is the result of extra activity in tissues. It's a case of the body responding to tissues that are in need of oxygen because the presence of carbon dioxide as a waste product of respiration means that extra oxygen would be needed to carry out this additional respiration. It's a perfect physiological response, this shift known as the Bohr shift, which happens because of increased carbon dioxide in tissues. While hemoglobin is capable of delivering more oxygen than it usually does, if more oxygen is supplied by gas exchange, then as hemoglobin returns to the lungs, it would find itself short of oxygen. In addition to the carbon dioxide causing the Bohr shift, the change in the pH level of the blood also triggers an increased ventilation rate as receptors located in the heart send messages to the brain which in turn stimulate increased ventilation. Another oxygen dissociation curve exists for the developing fetus. For it exchanges its carbon dioxide and oxygen by diffusion across the placenta. If it were that the fetal hemoglobin had the same attraction or affinity for oxygen as the maternal hemoglobin, then there would be no exchange of oxygen. So it is essential that the fetal oxygen dissociation curve is shifted slightly to the left of the maternal curve. For a given concentration or partial pressure of oxygen, maternal hemoglobin holds on to this amount of oxygen and the fetal hemoglobin would hold on to that much. Meaning that for any given amount of oxygen that the maternal hemoglobin holds on to, the fetus 
at that same concentration would have a greater affinity or attraction for that oxygen. And the end result would be that the fetus takes oxygen away from the maternal blood without the two blood systems actually having to mix. Hemoglobin is not the only molecule that transports oxygen. In mammals, and particularly in diving mammals like dolphins and whales, another protein, myoglobin, serves a very important function. For myoglobin becomes fully saturated at very low partial pressures or concentrations of oxygen. And it only releases significant amounts of oxygen when oxygen concentration or partial pressure is extremely low. The significance of this is that myoglobin acts as a backup means of storing oxygen in muscles. And it's very useful in mammals that dive to great depths in the ocean and require large amounts of oxygen to be stored. As we look briefly at this issue, it's useful to know the role of carbonic anhydrase, an enzyme, understand the role of the chloride shift, and to understand that hemoglobin, apart from being the carrier of oxygen, it also plays a role as a buffer. And it also plays a small role in the transport of carbon dioxide. But as tissues produce large amounts of carbon dioxide in respiration, some of that carbon dioxide dissolves in the plasma of blood and forms carbonic acid. Another bit of that carbon dioxide binds directly to hemoglobin molecules. But the bulk of the carbon dioxide that's transported is in the form of hydrogen carbonate ions. Carbon dioxide reacts with water in the presence of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then dissociates into hydrogen carbonate ions and hydrogen ions. The presence of these additional hydrogen ions changes the pH. This issue is addressed by hemoglobin acting as a buffer, resisting these potential changes in pH by sucking up or holding on to these hydrogen ions. The hydrogen carbonate leaves the cell and goes into the plasma and the ionic balance is restored by the influx of chloride ions. And this is referred to as the chloride shift. When blood reaches the lungs, the whole equilibrium that exists here and gets driven in one direction would move in the opposite direction. For now, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the lungs would be a lot lower than what it is in the blood. And therefore, carbon dioxide would tend to diffuse out of the blood and into the alveolar spaces. And in doing so, hydrogen carbonate ions would reassociate with hydrogen ions to form carbonic acid and then to return to water and oxygen. As the equilibrium is driven by the fact that in the lungs, the carbon dioxide concentration is much lower. Whereas in the tissues, the high concentrations drove the equilibrium toward the formation of the hydrogen carbonate ions. In the lungs, with the lower concentration of the carbon dioxide in the alveolar space, the whole process reverses itself. The equilibrium shifts